Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome back to our last session of uh, the Machine Learning in Science conference. Um, there might be a couple of new people in this session, so I'm also again explaining what the general mechanism is. Namely, we are going to have the presentation and I'm going to introduce our speaker in a minute. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can um, do so in uh, mainly in the Crowdcast uh, platform. And if you want to do that, there is this button, ask a question at the bottom right of your slides, uh, of, the, of, the, of the monitor. So please click on this, quest, uh, this box and ask questions. And for me, it's helpful if you do that already during the talk. And you can also look at the questions that other people have asked and you can upvote or downvote some of the questions. So I can then ask the most important questions at the end of the talk. So it's really helpful if you do that already during the talk, um, simply when you have a question, start typing. Um, other than that, I think everything is pretty clear. Um, you're supposed to, to listen to the presentation. <laughs> um, and I think we can now start. Um, so I'm really happy that today um, we have also a speaker from the physics department, um, Igor Lesanovsky. Um, because for machine learning, I think one of the disciplines where it's very uh, interesting and important to get more connections is like machine learning to physics. And for this reason, um, Igor is today going to talk about neural network dynamics in quantum many body systems. So Igor, please start. Thanks a lot, Ulrike. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, also, what I want to say, uh, I want to start with a disclaimer. So this is probably rather unrelated to the things we have been usually hearing uh, throughout this conference. So this is not really about applying neural network methods to maybe approximate um, or understand uh, quantum systems. This is about quantum systems and that under certain circumstances, these many body quantum systems can actually play a dynamics that is reminiscent of uh, a neural network one. And what we are wanting to do is we want to play with this dynamics. We want to ask, can we understand uh, quantum effects in there? Do they give rise to new features, new properties that uh, perhaps may be exploitable in the future? I can already tell you, I won't be able to give you an answer, but hopefully I will be able to show you something that you find interesting enough. And maybe after some time, there will be, yeah, some useful stuff coming out of this. So if you are interested in, in reading about this, so I, can uh, just uh, recommend to you these these articles here. We started working on the subject in 2017, and uh, yeah, well, we just uh, got uh, this week a paper accepted in Physical Review Letter. So from this perspective, it's going well. But uh, I leave it up to you to judge uh, whether you find this interesting or not. And uh, just one thing I also want to say: of course, I'm here in Tübingen, uh, but um, I have been here only since very recently. So I moved uh, to here in 2019. And actually, before that, I was a uh, professor at the University of Nottingham. And therefore, the work I'm going to talk about here is actually kind of a conglomerate of uh, uh, works that have been pursued at uh, Nottingham and then also further continued at uh, Tübingen. And uh, what I want to say also that, uh, at least at the beginning, uh, one of uh, my friends uh, and colleagues, uh, Markus Müller, who's now at uh, Aachen, uh, has been involved in this work too. And, one person uh, who is also uh, doing research related to um, neural network uh, met related methods in, in, in quantum systems is Paolo Mazza, who you have seen um, also in his spotlight presentation this afternoon. And then I also want to emphasize that I'm very grateful to receive uh, funding from the cluster. And also this is related to a project that I'm conducting with Sabine Andergassen and Georg Martius. Good, so this is the intro. Uh, now let's uh, get a bit closer to this idea. And I think before I start you, the, really the overview of the talk, I just want to uh, lay out in front of you what's actually the rationale of the research idea. So what we will do is we, we take a neural network and we say there are actually some uh, connections to uh, systems quantum systems or classical systems we are starting from actually of many interacting spins. And uh, so neural networks, at least these instances that I'm going to talk about here for the purpose of this talk, maybe not the most modern manifestation, you will see, uh, can be used, for instance, to retrieve stored information or patterns. And in the language of these many body quantum systems, this would translate into some kind of non-equilibrium dynamics. So this retrieval of stored information translates into some kind of dynamics that is uh, uh, taking place uh, in this quantum system. 
And then the stationary state of this dynamics, uh, well, this can be analyzed. So the stationary state brings you to stored patterns, stored information, but you can employ the physics language here and try to classify these patterns, stationary states in terms of phases and phase transitions. So this is what we like to do in uh, condensed matter physics. We want to understand uh, states of matter by classifying them in, in a way that we can put them into uh, certain boxes saying this is a phase belonging to this state of matter and so on and so forth. And now this is very well established. So these, these uh, idea in these blue boxes, uh, you will see this is basically what relates to the so-called Hopfield neural network and uh, Hopfield dynamics. But now what one can do is one can also ask, well, if one now takes this idea that has been uh, worked out some time ago, can one actually take this dynamics and augment it with quantum effects? So like coherence, superposition, perhaps entanglement, and what kind of new phases or classes of patterns uh, emerge in this situation. So this is kind of the question that I want to ask in this talk first. Can we introduce quantum effects in a meaningful way? And what kind of consequences does this have? And then finally, I will also show you that this is not something that is up in the air. This is really something that, at least in the context of the field of physics that I'm working in, is actually very timely because it relates to the physics that people are exploring right now in so-called synthetic quantum systems, where they really take single quanta, single atoms, uh, bring them together, expose them to light fields, and tailor really, I don't know, a chunk of artificial matter, which then undergoes dynamics that you can study. And I will show you that under some instances, the dynamics that you find that takes place inside these chunks of artificial matter is actually very reminiscent of uh, what you would think a neural network is doing while retrieving information. So now let's just have a look at the outline of the talk. So I will start with an introduction and I will already have told you that uh, this is based on the so-called Hopfield neural network. As I said, it's not the most modern manifestation of a neural network, but it's, I think, a nice uh, toy model basically to illustrate the idea. I will show you what pattern storage and retrieval uh, means in this context and how we can understand this from the perspective of statistical physics. So making a link to uh, between uh, this Hopfield dynamics and the statistical physics problem. So then we start uh, introducing these quantum effects. So we, I show you how one can actually bring these classical neural networks and quantum dynamics together. We we'll discuss a bit about thermal and, and quantum fluctuations, their role, and also show you then in the end how the quantum fluctuations actually can lead to novel types of phases or let's say novel in quotes quantum patterns what they're useful for whether they are useful whatsoever i am not able to tell you but okay this is also something i said at the very beginning in my disclaimer and then very briefly i will show you how these effects can be actually studied in principle in actual synthetic quantum systems so Let's come to this neural um, network, which is the Hopfield network, which we use for our purposes. It's a simple model of an associative memory. So what it means is, okay, I feed the network with some input, and if this input is similar enough to some stored pattern, this pattern will be retrieved. So I show you in a second how this works in practice. Now, this is constituted, this network is constituted of neurons, and these neurons are just uh, represented by a binary, binary variable. Sometimes we use this kind of operator notation for this sigma kz. So sigma z is an operator that can take two values, plus one or minus one, and k is simply labeling the neuron uh, that we are interested in. So now how does this work? So let's say you have a pixel array and you have some kind of a distorted version of the letter a here. So then what this neural network, this Hopfield network is doing, you start its dynamics, and then the dynamics is constructed such that in the course of the time evolution, when, it's a, when the system is reaching its stationary state, it will actually bring us to an output pattern, which is of course the kind of rectified A that is closest to the pattern that we chose to input. So this is how this works. And now what you can do is you can really formulate um, kind of dynamics such that this kind of transformation from this distorted to this rectified A is actually achieved in practice. And what you uh, can do is you can write this dynamics explicitly down. It's, it's a discrete time dynamics where you link basically the state of your spins at time t plus one to the state uh, of your uh, spins at time t 
And uh, what you introduce are these uh, kind of coupling constants here, which of course you see you are manifested also different versions of <laughs> neural networks. Uh, so, and now if you run this dynamics, uh, you can actually retrieve patterns which are uh, represented by vectors which we call xi and we label them these patterns with an index mu. For instance, if you think of our A, we can just say, well, we convert this uh, 2D pixel array into a vector of minus and plus ones. And uh, you see, I did it in a way here that this part here is representing the first row and these numbers here represent the second row. This is how you can convert uh, these pixel arrays into kind of a linear vector, which is much uh, more convenient to handle. And now the interesting thing is that in these networks here, there is in fact no learning, right? So because you input uh, the patterns right from the start. So here, and I show you what this means. It basically means that I can determine these coupling constants, uh, Jij, which uh, couple these uh, individual neurons just from the knowledge of the patterns that I want this, uh, this neural network to, to retrieve. Uh, you see here, there's a direct link between the coupling constants and the patterns that I want to retrieve. And in this way, if I cho choose this rule, which is the simplest one there is, uh, these patterns become fixed points of the dynamic. So what does that mean? So now from the dynamical perspective, you can uh, look at, uh, so to say, configuration space. So think of these, uh, rectangle this light blue rectangle is configuration space and now you have these patterns yeah so you have which are fixed points so one pattern is here and one pattern is here and you see these uh, square boxes these are basins of attraction yeah, of these patterns so this is for instance the basin of attraction for pattern one and now if you happen to have an initial state that comes to lie in the basin of attraction of this pattern one, for instance, like this distorted A with pattern one being the rectified A, then the dynamics will bring you um, eventually uh, to this fixed point and you will create this rectified version of the A out of this not so good looking one that you started out with. So this is the idea. And now what you can do is you can now uh, look at this problem from a slightly different perspective um, and a particular nice interpretation of this uh, neural network uh, dynamics is by assuming that this is representing some sort of spin glass where you actually have a network of coupled spins. And I think this connection is easy to make. Spins in the simplest manifestation can have two states. They can point up and they can point down. And what you just do is in order to establish this connection between this neural network and this spin glass is you say, I present a neuron in state plus one with a spin up and I represent a neuron in the state uh, minus one with a spin down. And then what you can do is you can write down this kind of network where you see each of these spins is represented by their respective operator. And you have these couplings uh, between spins here, for instance, between the first and the third or here between the first and the second. And of course, these coupling constants encode the patterns, but this is not even important here at this stage. These coupling constants just uh, tell you at the level of the statistical mechanics interpretation of how strong is the interaction between my spins that are actually representing neurons. And then the nice thing is that um, actually you can now uh, define some spin glass energy function. And as I said, this is your the interpretation of interacting spins. So this energy function is just uh, uh, one in which spins interact in a binary fashion and their interaction coefficients are exactly given by these J, I, J coupling constants that I showed you before that govern actually the dynamics such that uh, you get the patterns as the de desired fixed points. So now let's look a bit more uh, at this uh, neural network uh, from the statistical physics uh, um, perspective. So one thing I have not really talked about is uh, how many patterns can I actually store? Can I store an entire alphabet, for instance, from A to Z in this kind of spin system? And the answer is yes, but you have uh, a sufficient number of neurons, have to have a sufficient number of neurons or spins. So this uh, goes under the name capacity of the network. And one finds that uh, the capacity of the network, so the number of patterns NP that can be stored in this network is roughly 14% of the number of spins that make up this network. So 
And what does this mean now in practice? So, and this is very nicely illustrated now by this uh, spin glass idea. So, because this capacity and reaching the capacity means in the statistical physics language that I uh, undergo a phase transition from a retrieval phase to a spin glass phase. And what does that mean? So, in the retrieval phase, it's uh, I start somewhere with my initial condition. And this, let's say, in because I'm plotting now everything in terms of energy here of this uh, uh, spin uh, glass energy. So I start uh, with a certain initial state that has a certain energy. And now what the dynamics does, it makes this uh, kind of initial state, which I represent as this ball, roll down. And it reaches the bottom of this local basin of attraction. And there, you see, it basically corresponds to the retrieval of pattern Xi1. Now, what happens if I'm in the spin glass phase? then I have no longer these well-defined patterns. I'm kind of overloading the network. And what happens is that spurious minima emerge that have no longer anything to do with the number of patterns. So, and now you see that I have situations where I may start here, for instance, and I just get trapped in some kind of local minimum, which has nothing to do with any stored pattern. So this is why this is called a spin glass phase. You go from this very regular energy uh, surface with well-defined minima to a very rugged landscape where you basically get stuck immediately and in a state that is very close to your initial condition. Hence, this is called a glass. So now the nice thing about the statistical physics perspective is, is that we can actually introduce fluctuations. And this will also be the key to introduce quantum effects in a bit, because those at the end of the day will also result in, in uh, the emergence of fluctuations. So what you have, for instance, here is an initial state. I told you it rolls down and you retrieve the pattern. But now if you have thermal fluctuations, this spin can actually, this individual spins can actually flip up or down and down up randomly. So if this flipping is, is, is not too strong, so that means the temperature is low enough, then you still have somehow a state of your system that is, of course, now not a point anymore or a delta function, but it's kind of uh, broadened. But nevertheless, it's centered well. Uh, around one pattern, and therefore you would say, still, even with a finite degree of fluctuations, I can retrieve a pattern. Now, if this is the so-called retrieval phase again. Yeah, but now I can have another phase transition by increasing these uh, uh, thermal fluctuations, so meaning increasing temperature, so that these fluctuations actually bring are so strong that they can make my kind of state overcome these energy barriers. And what happens is that now the state of your system, the stationary state of the system is smeared out. You are no longer localized on one pattern, but you are lo uh, delocalized over the entire system. It's no longer possible kind of to retrieve a pattern with this strong amount of fluctuations. And this is a so-called paramagnetic phase. I have to speed up, I think, a little bit in order to make it. So, but I think those those were the important slides to actually convey the ideas, to just tell you what kind of phases my, my Hopfield network does possess and uh, what uh, fluctuations due to the stationary state manifold of my problem. So now, of course, you can model this. Yeah. So this is now the part where we really write things down. And uh, one way to model these kind of uh, fluctuating networks where we have thermal fluctuations is through so-called Glauber dynamics. It's actually not totally important yeah, what I'm writing here. So I'm just telling you, you can write down an equation that tells us uh, what is the rate for a downspin to flip to an upspin and uh, vice versa. And these rates depend on the energy that you gain or lose while when flipping a spin from up to down or down to up. And uh, now what you can do is you can ask in order to understand what is the state of the system, because you no longer have a well single uh, configuration that you approach, but you have these fluctuations. You have to now ask what is the probability of your system to be in a specific uh, uh, configuration, just very simple. For two spins, you have to now uh, understand what's the probability for two spins to point up, one up, one down, or both down. So this, of course, uh, spans a probability vector. And you can write down an equation of motion for this probability vector where spins flip up or down at a given rate. And these rates are chosen such that at the end of the day, if the temperature is uh, sufficiently low, you will be able to retrieve patterns or the pattern that is closest to your initial condition. So now let's make this quantum. So this is kind of old stuff. So this is a uh, statistical physics, uh, equilibrium made non-equilibrium uh, through Glauber dynamics. So now let's make this quantum. And uh, now 
what we need to do is we need to find a way to actually uh, bring together these kind of classical dynamics which quantum with quantum effects. And what we uh, have to do there is instead of looking at this probability vector that tells us with what probability are we in a certain configuration, we have to look at the density matrix. So I don't want to lose too much detail. It's just a bigger object that has more entries that because you have also quantum coherences and uh, degrees of freedom that you do not possess in a, in a classical world. And what you can do is you can actually uh, convert or promote uh, this classical Glauber dynamics that I just showed you, the single spin flip dynamics. It may look intimidating. It's actually not really, yeah, but uh, just look at, so to say, the, the, the colors are not so much at the equations. And believe me when I tell you that those two equations now mean exactly the same. I'm just expressing in this box here the classical Glauber dynamics in a way that looks quantum in the sense that it now acts on a density matrix and not on a probability vector. But at the end of the day, if you were to solve the dynamics here, you would find exactly the same result uh, as you would have found in the completely classical description with probabilities. But there's now an advantage. Yeah? Now, having used this kind of language of quantum mechanics, this framework of this quantum master equation, we have now a way of introducing quantum effects. And this is very nice. So you see, this is what we have just obtained. So the reformulation of my stochastic spin flip dynamics, the Glauber dynamics in terms of this uh, density matrix. But now at this level, I can actually introduce quantum effects that uh, is, which is done in this way. So where I just say, I do not have only this uh, classical spin flips, but I have a coherent evolution. This is the so-called von Neumann equation that allows us to uh, include Hamiltonian dynamics. Uh, meaning that I can now establish coherences and uh, and also entanglement. And now the question we ask in the next step is that how do these quantum fluctuations or these quantum terms actually uh, compete with these classical fluctuations due to temperature? So do they give us something new like new patterns or new phases of, I don't know, a new way to encode information? Uh, so, and this is the question we are asking on in the, in the next few slides. But before that, of course, we have to commit. Yeah, we have to ask. Uh, well, what is our quantum Hamiltonian that we are we are introducing? And we just uh, introduce a very simple one. Uh, it's just the analog uh, analogon of spin flips uh, that uh, take place with a certain rate omega. And now you ask, okay, why is this not the same as just the classical dynamics that I showed you before? Yeah, it's different because now you really have uh, promoted these neurons. Uh, to quantum objects. So when you start with a neuron in an upstate, then acting with this Hamiltonian on it, you can bring it actually to a superposition state between it being up and uh, well, it being down essentially at the same time. And this is manifestly non-classical and quantum. And the idea is now to understand what happens. So uh, we can now look at uh, the dynamics um, of the order parameter of this problem. So I haven't really dropped this term order parameter yet, but you will see in a second that this is kind of a useful concept. And the order par parameter that we are here using now is just the overlap of our instantaneous spin state. So basically the scalar products of the plus ones and minus ones uh, times the pattern that we want to retrieve. So this is basically this. And then we take the expectation value and divide by n so that when, when we have achieved complete overlap with one uh, pattern, this order parameter is one. Now that we have quantum, uh, we no longer have an order parameter, so to say, for the classical direction, which is represented by the sigma z uh, variable, but we have also an order parameter component that is non-classical. So this is really a component that points in the transverse direction, which is a degree of freedom that is just popping up if you think make things quantum, which of course does not exist in the classical Hopf field dynamics. So now what we can do is we can now find the equations of motion for this disorder parameter because these allow us to analyze what are the stationary states, Do I uh, am I able to retrieve patterns uh, if I wait only for a long enough time. So let's do this, write down the order parameters. There are some nonlinear uh, equations, uh, they, they obey some nonlinear e equations, which are not too important at the moment, but okay, they can be solved. This is the bottom line. And if we are in the retrieval phase, 
a stationary solution of these uh, equations would look like that. So I would have a vector which is one and zero otherwise. So that means I have perfect overlap with one pattern and zero overlap with all the others. If I'm in the so-called paramagnetic phase, then all these order parameter components are actually zero, meaning I have no overlap with any pattern, which basically says that the fluctuations are too strong as, as I illustrated before. Good. So now let's look at the stationary state of this uh, kind of quantum enhanced top field uh, neural network. And of course, here you put the time derivatives of your order parameters to zero and you get an equation which you can solve. Not too important. Yeah. The bottom line is that this equation is in fact identical to the one that you obtain in the classical top field model. But the difference is uh, being that the temperature, so this is the actual gist of the slide, that the temperature is now rescaled. It's the temperature that you had originally uh, times one plus eight times omega squared, where omega is this uh, strength of the quantum fluctuation. So you would say Oof, that uh, makes some more sense. I have introduced another source for fluctuations and hence, okay, this effectively increases my temperature. So actually nothing has happened at this level. This looks completely classical, which is perhaps not great. Uh, and, and you ask, well, <laughs> Okay, let's not give up. Let's see whether there's generally something new. And in fact, there is something new if you dig a little bit closer. So you can analyze the problem now a bit more carefully, look at the dynamics uh, for particular instances of patterns that you draw from a random distribution. It's not so important. And what you then do is you perform a stability analysis around this, the stationary points, meaning the patterns of the dynamics, and see whether there are similarities or differences with respect to the Hopf field model. And out comes this phase diagram, which I will just briefly discuss. So you have here a phase, um, which is the retrieval phase, uh, which you have for sufficiently low temperatures, uh, lower than one. And in this phase, what you find is that your system, this is kind of the sketch of the, the flow of these uh, differential equations that you solve, which has two fixed points, and you always have two fixed points just by symmetry of this problem. And you see this retrieval phase now, uh, this retrieval phase now, uh, the phase transition as we uh, as we increase the quantum fluctuation moves to lower and lower temperatures, meaning that once we cross this line, we end up in the paramagnetic phase. So this makes makes a lot of sense. This is just what I said before. So that effectively these quantum fluctuations rescale temperature, they increase the temperature. So, but then you can ask, well, is there actually something new? And in fact, there is something new. So you find that there is a phase here, which we call limit cycle phase, where you don't get stationary patterns, but you get things that uh, you get solutions that are basically oscillating in time. Yeah? So there are no stationary points, but there are all manifolds yeah, around which your stationary state oscillates. And it can even be more crazy. You can actually have also coexistence regions of uh, these oscillating solutions and these kind of canonical uh, stationary points that uh, correspond to classical patterns. So the question is now, is this any in any form useful? Is this, uh, it's definitely new. It's definitely a consequence of these quantum effects. So the question that we are currently exploring is whether we can use this in some beneficial way, maybe to encode some kind of quantum patterns in these uh, augmented uh, Hopfield neural networks. So very briefly, because I'm realizing I have two more minutes, which is actually bang on, I think, in terms of timing. Let's now uh, come back to the question of physical realization. So because I'm not telling you this, I mean, of course, from kind of from the, from the theoretical perspective, I think it's a very interesting problem. And we started to, to really treat it as such as a toy problem at the beginning. But in fact, there are physical realizations of such a problem. And I just uh, encourage you to have a read at this, uh, of this paper. Maybe you just have a look at this uh, synopsis, which is a bit more accessible for a broader audience. Which is uh, this paper is about realizing a system uh, similar to what I was talking about, just by putting atoms, yeah, which can encode spin degrees of freedom into the light field of a so-called cavity. So you have a trapped light field. What now happens is that the atoms interact with the light. They can absorb or emit a photon. And now you see when one Im atom emits a photon, the other one can absorb it. And by this, these photons actually start mediating interactions between the atoms. And of course, you can now also make this analogy between the excited state of the atom 
uh, being equivalent to the spin-up state of our fictitious spin being equivalent to the plus one state of our Hopfield neuron. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. And the nice thing is about these systems that they are very well controlled. And as I said at the beginning, these are artificial systems where you understand basically everything. You understand what the photons do, you understand what the atoms do, you understand the coupling between the atoms and the photons, which is parameterized by a set of parameters or coupling constants. So this is the last slide. And now what you find, and if you're interested uh, in this, I just uh, want to direct you to this paper. You find that actually in this system, the uh, interactions between the atoms that encode spins is very similar to the interaction uh, energy uh, that you would uh, write down if you were to use the statistical physics uh, perspective uh, on a Hopfield network. So there's a direct correspondence. These patterns, the coupling patterns between my neurons are actually encoded now uh, through the coupling constants between the atoms and the photon field. And also what you find in these system, then as a consequence is that the dynamics proceeds in a very similar way as, as it would proceed in, in an actual neural uh, network that you build on your computer, let's say. And what you, for instance, find is that also like in this neural network uh, um, discussion that we had before, you find a transition between a retrieval phase where you can restore patterns as a stationary state of your temporary dynamics to a state where you are paramagnetic, where you actually have two high fluctuations so that uh, you are unable to retrieve the information that is stored. All right, so I hope I could convey at least the basic idea. Uh, just the the starting point was the statistical mechanics perspective on the on the Hopfield neural network. There was a very natural way, I would at least say, to uh, introduce quantum effects in in this Hopfield network. It gives rise to new types of stationary solutions, new style, new types of patterns. Question is whether this is useful. But then maybe one can actually use these uh, physical implementations with uh, atom cavity systems to do something that is perhaps ultimately beneficial and brings this neural network and quantum worlds even closer together. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Um, so admittedly, I'm not a physicist, so I would have some questions um, to see whether I, I got it roughly right. Um, so when you say, so, so you have your networks and then this, um, the individual um, nodes in your networks are the, the the spin, I don't know whether these are, at, it's not atoms, yeah, right, right, right. Right. right? Um, and then what are the edges? Like, is this when, whenever two particles are interacting with each other, then, then there's an edge in this network or? Correct. Yeah. So right. it's a link. And, and then, link. and then essentially you say, um, so, so you start with some initial state and then you, you let the system run until it finally hopefully reaches a, a like a, a, state, a, exactly. a stationary state. And this is then one pattern that the network can express, right? Exactly. One of the, and you have many stationary states mm -hmm. and the one you select depends on your initial condition. So. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you said, because you said the capacity of the network is the number of patterns that can be stored. So this is then roughly sort of the number of local optima you have in your energy function. Is that yeah, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. And, um, Let's no, no, not well. This is the number of patterns. Uh, if the number of patterns corresponds to the number of local minima, you are fine. You are in this retrieval phase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then, if you try to store too many patterns in too few spins, your energy landscape would look like that. So there's no uh, resemblance anymore of these mm -hmm. clear minima. So it's very rugged. You get stuck immediately when you start the dynamics. So would you be able if you if you if someone someone sort of gives you the geometry of this network, like which spins are connected with which other spins, could you predict this sort of the number of the number of patterns? I mean, of course you could try all of them, but that yes, would. Yes, I mean there there are. I mean, of course this links strongly to optimization problems. Yeah, so which, uh, well, within uh, the let's say. If you are able to solve these these associated opti optimization problems, you can also solve what the ground state uh, is or the, the, the stationary states of this uh, network dynamics are. So I think I'm that is mapping. I'm asking this because, like in machine learning, we have um, also notions of capacities of. I mean, it's and I'm trying to to see whether there's a connection between a I capacity think, of a, of a learning algorithm or a function class. It, and essentially, it also tells you, like in a classification problem, how many different patterns um, would you be able to generate with a certain algorithm. Yeah. I, I think maybe if I can comment. Okay, I'm trying to interpret your question, and I think there isn't there is an answer that is maybe a bit more interesting. Let's say, yeah, because I mean, this is also linking to 
the question, okay, why bother making this quantum, right? Because what you definitely don't want in your optimization problem, let's say, for instance, is to get stuck in these local minima, right? Mm -hmm. So, and now if you introduce these quantum effects, what they do to you is they open different pathways. You see, a, at the middle of the, of the talk, at some point, I, I told you that there are different degrees of freedom popping up that were not existent in, in the classical uh, representation. So these might open up paths yeah, for relaxation that might then avoid this issue of uh, getting stuck in local minima. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be by by if one would be if it would be possible to exploit these to sort of find or relate it to some kind of better optimization algorithm or yeah. something like that to to be able to escape this local optimal exactly, problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds really cool. I think it's an interesting area to follow up, even though, admittedly, I didn't get all the details, but it sounds like it's a perfect uh, question also at the intersection of physics and machine learning. I also have another question and um, in, in the chat and uh, just to, uh, to the audience, if you have more questions, please type them in the chat now, because otherwise I'm not going to see them or in the ask, um, ask a question box. So there's one question, which um, is, how does the new phase correspond to states in the Hopfield network? Yeah, this is a good point. Yeah. So, well, the answer, short answer is we don't really know. Yeah. So, also, the issue is in, in the original idea of the Hopfield network, you basically encode your patterns directly in these coupling constants between the spins, right? Which makes this very elegant. So, now the question would be can I now dial my coupling constants in, in a way that allows me to, let's say, store certain quantum states, yeah? let's say, as stationary points? Uh, of this network. So this this would be the next question, I think, to ask there. This is really just something that we we are exploring currently, so there's no definite answer. There are sample kind of, let's say, almost trivial ways to generalize this to quantum by just changing the, ba rotating the basis, and then you get automatically quantum effects in. But the Interpretation question is really one which I'm unable to answer yeah, now in a convincing manner. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's yeah, that's perfectly fine, and I think it simply shows that there's an there's uh, lots of, of of space for new developments. Um, sorry, you. Yeah, I'm I'm just saying so because maybe also if I look at the history of this of this project, right? It started really as a toy problem. And we also never believed that this was uh, getting any significance. Yeah, but then, as I said, I mean, with the advent of these development of the experimental techniques now, you can really ask. I mean, this is why what what makes it interesting. You can, in principle, really build this kind of quantum neural network. And now, of course, I think it's a valid program of research to ask. Okay, what can we do with it? Right, and this is something that we we want to start. Now, I mean, of course, it's not, so to say, connected immediately to what we've been hearing, I mean, throughout this, this conference, but I think there's some, some, some way in it, yeah, and, and maybe it leads to something useful, maybe not, yeah, who knows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's research, right? We never know. Yeah. <laughs> that's why we're doing this job, I think, yeah. <laughs> because you're curious. Okay. Um, thanks a lot for your presentation, Igor. Yeah. Um, this was the last talk in our conference. Um, I'd now um, like to ask the tech team uh, to allow Philip and myself to give the final remarks to the conference. So thanks again for your nice presentation. Yeah, thank you very much for asking questions. <laughs> okay, um, Philip is here. Um, Thanks everybody um, in the audience who is still here. Thanks for listening. I think we really, really had an interesting conference. Um, we didn't really discuss anything about the final remarks, so we are just doing this ad hoc now. <laughs> so I really enjoyed the conference a lot. There were lots of interesting talks and we had in this um, virtual format, of course, allowed us to bring in many more speakers than we would otherwise be able to get into Tübingen um, from all the diverse uh, locations of the earth. Um, what I also found is interactions, of course, are a bit more complicated, like it's not as as we used to have it in the previous years, sitting in this cozy room in Alt Alte Aula and like having time to chat all the time and sort of get getting more interactions done. But maybe this is going to work um, again, maybe next year or in this fall or so. Um, if you want to send us feedback about the conference, then maybe also you can do that by email um, and then we see how, how we can invoke that for the next kind of conference. We have um, also, of course, some people to thank for their uh, great support in um, 
in setting this up. Um, there's uh, Teresa Autala who just joined us a few weeks ago and already uh, dug into um, organizing this conference and putting everything together. Um, so thanks a lot for that. Um, and then there's a couple of PhD students from our Innovation Fund program. So you also heard about their research. So Jonathan Fuhr, Matthias Karlbauer, David Elias Künstel, um, they really um, manage everything behind the scenes um, today and um, all, the, all the other days and made sure that everything is run smoothly. And of course, in, in general, we are very well supported um, and also kept alive with snacks and drinks by our um, by our central office. So Sebastian Schwenk, Till Gocht, and uh, Michaela Bitzer and Heike Grösel. So thanks everybody um, for putting in this way, uh, work. Thanks to the speakers uh, for taking part in that and then um, hopefully see you again soon. Thanks everybody. Goodbye, enjoy the sunshine outside. Bye.